how are you? We ask each other. Uh, we reply, I'm doing okay, I'm surviving. Uh, my expression, I'm keeping on, keeping on. Uh, but here's the thing, I don't want to survive. I want to flourish, I want to thrive. I don't want my life to be on hold. Uh, one of the reasons I chose for us to look at the book of Titus this spring is because right at the end, uh, Paul urges his readers not to live unproductive lives. And isn't this part of the problem of lockdown? We feel unproductive. Uh, we can't do the things we want to do. We feel as though we can't do the things we ought to do. Uh, last week, uh, I said, I feel as though I'm coasting. I don't want to coast. Uh, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. Uh, Paul's aim, Paul's goal, Paul's passion is to further the faith of God's people and God's yet to be people. Uh, but a growing faith, a fruitful faith, a productive faith, what does that look like? Well, Paul now gives us a glimpse. Uh, Paul writes to Titus, who is on the little Greek island of Crete. People had become Christians. They were gathering together in congregations. Uh, Paul says to Titus, uh, I need you to set up a leadership group for each congregation headed up by elders, uh, mature Christians. And these instructions are of value to us, not just when we're looking to appoint leaders for the various uh, things we do in our church, but also because they give each of us a hint of the kind of person we each want to be, what we want each other to be, uh, no matter what our specific role is in our church family. Uh, without just for a second, without looking down at the text, let's, let me just ask a question. Uh, what does a mature Christian look like? Uh, and we maybe say, well, someone who comes along to uh, church, whether in person or online, every week they can. Well, they pray, they, they read their Bibles, they give their money generously, uh, they take communion, they maybe belong to a small group. Uh, they get involved uh, with our church. Uh, and to our surprise, Paul doesn't go there. It seems that what I do on a Sunday, what I do on the Sympathia Zoom account is not the evidence of godliness that Paul is looking for. Now, please don't hear me wrong. All the things I've just mentioned, they are vital and they are crucial, but they are merely a means to an end. In themselves, they can mean nothing. Uh, rather unexpectedly, Paul doesn't see these things as the mark of maturity. Instead, he says, verse six, an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. The proof of the pudding, it seems, is not what I do in the church building or on our church Zoom account. It's what I do outside of it. Uh, these verses have the potential to be devastating, don't they? Uh, are you the same person at home as you are in church? Uh, if a film was secretly made of your home life, your work life, your, your social life, and that was then played over the Internet... Would everyone immediately spot a huge inconsistency? Uh, now, before we squirm uh, too much, we need to remember that apart from Jesus, no one is perfect. Uh, this side of heaven, there will always be inconsistencies in my life. Day in, day out, I will fall short. Sometimes I will catastrophically fall short. But if there is a fundamental disconnect between the words I sing and pray on a Sunday and how I speak to my husband on a Monday, or how I speak to my work colleague on a Tuesday, or how I respond to the call centre assistant who's really irritated me on a Wednesday, 
and how I spend my money on a Thursday or the amount I drink on a Friday or the sort of films I watch on a Saturday. I wonder if you find verse eight magnetic, by, my, by which I mean you're pulled to it. Verse eight, rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Hospitable people, they, they welcome you into their lives. They make you feel at ease. They don't look down on you. Uh, one who loves good, someone who is a lover of good. Self-controlled, not pulled by every passion, every whim, every desire. Don't we love people like this? Don't we feel secure with people like this? Don't we long to be people like this? Uh, why do we long to be like this? Because Jesus is like this. We were designed and made to be like this. Verse eight is godliness, is Christian maturity, is the key to a productive life. But you could validly ask, how does the gospel of Jesus fit into this? Because I know lots of very hospitable people who are not Christians. I know very many people who do really good things who have no interest in God. And then I read verse nine and I say that the mature Christian is mature in character and hence mature in behavior because they are mature in belief. Verse nine, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Uh, the trustworthy message, what is that? Uh, what is the message which God has revealed to the apostles, uh, the faith which the Bible proclaims? Well, we can glance back up to verse four for a summary. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Saviour. We need God's grace. That word means gift. We need peace with God to be at peace with God rather than being at war with God. We need to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. That word means king. We need a saviour. God is incredibly good and loving and gracious. Uh, Jesus is, verse 8, he's hospitable, a lover of good, he's self-controlled, upright, disciplined, and he demands we be too for our good, for the good of his world, world for his glory. Yes, we try hard and we make inroads into verse eight. And sometimes our non-Christian friends make even greater inroads, which humbles us. But no matter how hard any of us try, we are not the people we must be. And so every year that goes on simply adds to the list of people I hurt, adds to the cumulative disrespect I show God. I need a saviour, a rescuer. And the Bible's trustworthy message is that I find one in Jesus. And so I cry, be my king. I will listen to you. I will surrender my life to you. I will obey you. Be my saviour. Save me from my sinful past by paying my penalty. Save me from my present nature by gifting me your Holy Spirit to change me. Save me in the future by guaranteeing my eternity. I cry that and he responds, yes, I'd rather die than you live eternity without me. And so Sunday by Sunday, the believer meets with other Christians just as we are doing in order to, verse eight, in, in order to hold firmly to this trustworthy message, encouraging each other, helping each other with our thinking so that our Sundays impact our Mondays. And our words spoken at home mirror the words spoken in our church gatherings uh, and the generosity of our attitude at school, at work, on the rugby field is a mere extension of the generosity Jesus has shown us. And the purity of our values and desires and actions 
increasingly reflect those of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the question. How are you doing Monday to Saturday in respect of the things that really matter? Your growth in character, in godliness, your love of God, your love of goodness, your love of others. Are you growing? Are you thriving? That was a slightly mean question, wasn't it? It was a guilt inducing question. So here's a better question. Do you want to grow? Do you want to thrive? Do you want to be useful and effective, furthering your own faith, furthering the faith of others? Uh, and if you do, the starting point is not you need to try harder. No, the starting point is the gospel. You have a rescuer and a king in Jesus, and he is looking to change you so that you are able to live Sunday out on a Monday. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is looking to turn you away from the things in verses six and seven that you're ashamed of. He's looking to turn you into someone who is hospitable, who loves good, who is self-controlled and upright and disciplined. And servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day you die, the day you see him face to face, that will be the day that you look in the mirror and see astonishing beauty and perfection. I'm doing OK. I'm surviving. No, our God plans for us to more than survive. He plans for us to thrive. And mature. And make us productive for him.